Hi there, this is Mr. Wishart from Lagan College History Department. Um, I'm just going to take you through, try to guide you through this 22 mark question. It comes obviously at the end of the, the Paper 2 GCSE History. Um, and it's, it's one question that's worth a lot of marks and it could cost you uh, grades as well too. And it's also quite, it's quite reasonably straightforward. I'm hoping this presentation allows you to see that. Okay, so first off, this question itself, if you look at paper two, it's worth 22 out of your 60 marks. So it's about 37% of your paper two mark. You have to get it right. This could mean the difference between grades, not just marks. Um, we estimate that you should definitely spend 25 minutes on this question on its own. So whatever way you're keeping time, make sure you set aside 25 minutes. Don't let any of your time be eaten up in any other questions. Make sure this one's done and done well. If you do that, you're ensuring a good chance of getting top grades. Okay, the paper itself, you can see in this paper that you actually have a choice between two different uh, questions. Uh, have a good look through that uh, and make sure you choose the, the right one for you. Uh, if you have a good look, spend at least a minute just making sure you choose the right selection first. That'll definitely help you. You don't want to be you know, halfway into a question and realise, oh, I should have did the second one or I should have did the first one. Uh, next, at the very bottom here, always make sure you tick which question you've you've did, which question you've actually um, accomplished. Uh, that'll help out with the examiners as well too. Right. In terms of key tips, then, we'll see it's a, a range of really, really good tips uh, for you to follow. Uh, I'm going to include a couple of uh, tips here. So, first of all, it's it's an essay question. Don't forget that. It needs a very clear introduction. It needs paragraphs. I'd recommend three paragraphs to follow the, the three bullet points. And it needs a conclusion as well, too. Um, how much should you write? Well, it really is how long is a piece of string, to be honest. Um, it depends which way you write and how big you write but what I am going to suggest is you do get these amount of papers here you've got four clear parts of the exam paper that are devoted to this question you do not have to use all four and um, it obviously suggests that you write as much as possible and I would suggest that too but uh, I would also suggest that you could you know get a full mark um, answer in three of those um, three of those pages it does depend on the quality of what you write and not the quantity. You can also get uh, write more as well too. If you wanted to go over this amount, you can also uh, get more paper too. But uh, try to be focused, try to be on the button, try to answer the question and get as much detail in as possible, but in, in a very focused way. Examiners love to see the answer followed in a very focused way. Okay, so this is a type of 22 mark question you could get how did relations between the United States of America and the USSR change in the years 1945 to 56? So it's asking you how did relations change between those two superpowers? And the the date range is 1945 to 56. It's also asking you to do two things here. It's asking you to follow the guidelines in the answers so these three guidelines down below. And it's also asking you to combine that with your own knowledge. You have to show a combination of these both to get top marks. Okay, so uh, these three guidelines are highly important. You have to make sure, have to make sure to use all three uh, to stand any chance of getting into the top uh, levels for this question. Um, so you should spend, um, you know, spend a bit of time uh, on each different um, bullet point and make sure there's enough detail in each to uh, ensure marks. All right. I would also suggest this. It is in chronological order, so it does form the skeleton, the structure for your answer, uh, and it does uh, go in the order of time, the order usually it, that it's happened. That also leads to uh, very clear interconnections between the different points. You shouldn't like it, write three standalone mini essays in this here. They should interconnect in some way. The the questions usually have bullet points that you know one might lead to another, might lead to another. Sometimes like a domino. Um, uh, so do bear in mind that um, all three should perhaps be connected in some in some way. So chronological order is important. Um, I've tried to give an example of this. So for example, if you look down here, the, the Soviet treatment, if you're looking at Soviet challenges and how they responded, well, look at Hungary, 1956. That was treated abominably. It was treated terribly in how the Soviets marched in 
They killed thousands of people. They destroyed a beautiful couple of city, and uh, they forced uh, lots of people to to become refugees. Uh, but compare that to Berlin uh, in 1959 to 61. That crisis was dealt with in a, in a very different way, not necessarily a less brutal way. Um, they, you know, they built a they built the Berlin Wall in this respect, but um, certainly the same amount of people weren't massacred in this uh, same circumstances. And in Prague, 1968, similar sort of challenges to the Soviet Union, but they dealt with it in uh, a robust way. But again, there wasn't a, there certainly wasn't as many people killed. So perhaps. The treatment of Hungary and the results of that there led to different approaches to the other two events and that's what I kind of mean about connections. All right so next uh, what I would definitely 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 suggest this is a common problem for 22 marker you have to you have to answer what it's saying in the question okay focus on that question answer what it's saying you can't have three stories about Hungary and about Czechoslovakia, about Vietnam, about Afghanistan. Uh, you have to answer what the question's actually asking about. Okay, so if it's asking about causation, you spend time focused on causation. You can give it a background, but you have to remain focused on that question the whole way through. Um, a lot of students lose lots of marks by not by not following that guidance. So don't give blue by blue accounts of each and every event in the questions time frame. Examiners really get frustrated by that. They ended up just reading waffle. They like clear, concise, focused analytical answers. That's what, after all, you're getting assessed on, that skill of giving clear, concise, focused answers, uh, answering the question that's given, not everything I know about. Okay, so read that question carefully and I would suggest that you highlight those keywords. You know, if it's on continuity, if it's on chain, significance or impact, circle the key parts of the question. Uh, also circle the dates. You do not want to like kind of move outside those time frames because you don't get any marks. If you're answering something on way out of the time frame, you won't get any marks on it. So stick religiously to what's being asked. Okay, so this is an example here. Um, how did the USSR respond to challenges to its power in the 1950s and 60s? Well, it's asking you to um, explain how the Soviet Union responded to challenges, responded to challenges it's not asking about any causes, it's asking about responses to those challenges. So that's what your answer should remain focused on. Okay, so uh, it also gives the time frame of 1950s and 1960s. And you can see there are clear dates there, 56, Hungarian Uprising, and 68 with uh, Czechoslovakia. So we use that as the, the basis for your answer. Okay, so... Uh, this is uh, an example, a waggle we call it, so what a good one looks like. Um, and it is stating, how did the relations between the USA and USSR change in the years 1945 to 1956? It's asking you to follow the guidelines and combine that with your own knowledge. And it's given three very concise bullet points. The break time of the wartime alliance, the Berlin blockade, an airlift, 1948-49 and events in the 1950s. Can you see the way this events in the 1950s is quite vague? Um, and I think that's going to be a, a kind of a theme. I think examiners are going to put this type of at least one bullet point in which kind of like teases out of you your historical knowledge. It's not really giving you exactly what to write about but it's teasing out what you know. So I'd be aware of that there. Um, okay, so let's let's have a go at this. Um, so we have with any uh, any essay, we have to sort of give it a bit of a skeleton, and you know, you've got your reduction, you've got your first guideline being dealt with in a paragraph, your second guideline in a paragraph, your third guideline, and finishing off with a nice, juicy conclusion, just, just rounding everything up. Okay, it's like a, a burger here, hamburger. You've got a small bit at the top here, small bit at the bottom, but this is a nice, juicy interior here that you uh, want to spend some time on. Okay. So how did relations between the USA and USSR change? Well, first off, how do you introduce it? Well, that is my introduction there. I'm not going to read it out to you, but you can see firstly, one big tip. I have used the wording of the question in my introduction. How did relations between the USA and USSR change in the years 50 or 45 to 56? Relations between the USA and USSR changed dramatically between 1945 and 56. That's an immediate focus. It's keeping my answer nice and focused from the very beginning. 
and the examiner will uh, like that they'll know that you're going to answer the question asked and then it's given a little bit of detail and out just i just given a brief outline of that period and how it's a little bit of a roller coaster and how things get uh, go from quite good uh, through to, to reasonably bad um, at the very end okay so i'm setting out my stall but i'm not giving all my details and next i'm going to attempt to answer this um, in terms of the breakdown of the wartime allowance okay so use the wording and you can kind of see that there all right so it's nice short focused concise let's go to our first bit of point so how do i write it well this is my first paragraph you can see it's reasonably it's reasonably long it's, it shouldn't be like much more than uh, maybe three quarters of a page in uh, the exam booklet um but you can see the red underlined uh, la uh, words here are my what i call golden nuggets and it basically adds a, a frame to the answer these are nuggets these are uh, bits of detail that add to the the answer itself so uh, how can i explain the relations between east and west and how they changed well we do know at the very uh, beginning of 1945 that these three powers, the, the British, the Americans, and the, the Soviet Union, they were an alliance. They were the, known as the Big Three. They were fighting a common enemy, enemy which was Hitler and, and, and Germany uh, in Europe. So that kept them bonded together uh, towards a final victory. And what's more, there was three kind of friends. You had Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Roosevelt, quite a sunny disposition about him and he he kind of like looked uh, for the best in Stalin and certainly didn't uh, um, didn't think the same of him as, as Churchill who who really did not trust Stalin whatsoever so there's a certain warmth in the relationship at this key uh, conference was at Yalta in February 1945 what you should really be aware of though and should really know is that by the summertime things are in all respects heating up and at Potsdam there is a complete change. Uh, Hitler's dead, Germany's defeated, they're about to win in uh, the Far East in the next uh, month or so, and the tensions in the relationship are very clearly cracking. Truman has replaced Roosevelt, who, who died, sadly died, um, and he has a, a very different outlook uh, towards the Soviets. He shares Churchill's mistrust, and he is really determined to keep an eye on them and what's more he has these atomic bombs that he's only just found out about it whenever he became president and he's going to use them and he's determined to use this almost like a political tool to show the soviets who is boss uh, what's more stalin realizes he does know that there is some form of a weapon of mass destruction to be produced and he's very angry about this here um at, at you know how this um their previously good relationship has, has really been one of facade in terms of what he thinks and they've kept this film in the western eyes though well stalin has eastern europe completely rolled up his huge red army is the biggest in the world and it completely dominates eastern europe what's more they've put in public governments uh, in those regimes uh, in those countries and those public governments are, are controlling things on behalf of moscow um, stalin sees it as like all i am looking for here is a buffer zone um, i have 20 million war dead um, we do not want that to happen again. We came very close to collapse at one point, and we need a buffer zone in Eastern Europe to protect the motherland, which is the Soviet Union. Churchill doesn't agree with this at all. He sees this as a form of aggrandizement, where the, the Soviets are basically building an empire behind this iron curtain, those very emotive words that he's used. Uh, and behind that iron curtain is this uh, Soviet imperial um, group of countries that are quite dangerous to the west and what's more he believes they're determined to spread well truman takes up churchill's uh, belief and he listens to george kennan one of his advisors as well too and he's determined to stop this and he's determined to stop it to stop the soviet advance by using political economic and military means this truman doctrine really did set out that uh, politically he was committing the united states to stopping communism and he's going to back that up with um, with martial aid, which is, is actually 13 billion, not 3 billion. So 13 billion pounds worth of um, of American dollars, which are pumped into Europe in a bid to shore up those economies, um, secure capitalism, secure democracy, and dissuade any form of like a threat from communism. So this is a real East versus West showdown here. Um, 
and it leads us on to our our second point, which really is the showdown. So the biggest showdown you should be aware of is the Berlin blockade and airlift. At this stage, this is where things really, really do become almost hot and relations are really challenged. You have to point that out. Relations really challenged in this period, 48 to 49, by the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift. So it seemed very much um, that uh, the Soviet Union was, um, from the Soviet Union's point of view, that the West was actually trying to confront uh, the Soviet Union itself. And this was very clear. Stalin believed in Berlin. And Berlin was the crux of Europe. It's where East openly met West and is perhaps the most dangerous part of the whole world at this stage. So divided into four zones, three uh, different Western zones and the Soviet zone as well. But Western actions did aggravate Stalin uh, terribly. And uh, especially they, they merged the three, their three zones into a zone called Trizonia. Uh, which looked as if they were ganging up in the Soviet Union. It looked very much as if they were trying to rebuild their western section of Germany. Um, and the evidence for that was they were building, a, or they introduced a new Deutschmark currency, which was a strong currency, and obviously aiming to build up West Germany into a strong economic power again. Stalin wanted it to remain a poor agricultural power, so it could never be a threat again. And the West was pumping in martial aid, lots and lots and lots of martial aid, they were wanting them to become, especially West Berlin, to become a shop window for capitalism and a shop window for democracy. The Western Berlin was very much gleaming in a certain respect. Um, it had food on the shelves, it had uh, jobs, it had lots of money, it had evidence in the streets, it had cars in the streets. While well, the East was struggling to rebuild a, a battered city, and a lot of its, um, a lot of its goods and. Uh, factories were being shipped off to the east as reparations. So as a result, thousands of people marched and voted with their feet. They, they moved to the west. Um, and Stalin realised this was a big brain drain. He realised um, Berlin was being used for spying. And he was, he was determined to stop this. So uh, enough was enough in his eyes. And he shut all road, rail and canal links, which was what the Berlin blockade was. What did this mean? Well... 100 miles into the Soviet territory, into the east, 2 million uh, citizens were actually trapped. It was like a noose around Berlin, um, West Berlin, and uh, these citizens faced starvation, they faced a uh, winter of, uh, of no fuel, and the western powers were faced with a real dilemma, what, what to do? Um, and they decided, well, you know, what we're going to do is we are going to challenge this. It's too strategic to let go. We cannot let Berlin go. They organised a huge massive airlift, um, internationally famous. Um, Berlin had to be kept supplied at 24-7 throughout all this time. Um, that meant planes landing every two to three minutes. They had only had 30 minutes to offload all their goods and take off again. And that was going on for over a year. Um, and it was successful. Stalin could not shoot down any airplane. That would be an act of war and something he could not, uh, could not fathom. He was very surprised. He was he couldn't believe how much the West was willing to risk on uh, defending uh, West Berlin, and he had to call off the airlift, obviously, in 1949. Uh, but again, a real dark period in East-West relations, um, and one uh, which uh, took it to uh, new lows. And even with the end of the blockade, uh, things are, are not going to really improve, as you're going to see in the next bullet points. So, um, okay, so. This really does lay out the whole um, the whole paragraph in relation to the question as well too. And finally, you have the third paragraph. Now this is events in the 1950s. It's not on the Hungarian Revolution, but you know by the inclusion of 1956 in the question that, that is what some of this is definitely going to be about. What you have to bear in mind though is in some cases, uh, Western and Eastern relations do tend to become like a roller coaster. And this is... Uh, very true in this last paragraph. So you might focus on hung Hungary. If you do, you're leaving out a uh, part where you know, there is a bit of warmth in the relationship. So events did seem to be very low by the 1950s, the early 1950s. Eastern Europe, controlled by dictatorial, harsh Soviet regimes, countries like East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, all really harshly controlled. Their economies were 
uh, reorganized the supply of the USSR. They were very poor. A lot of them had lost wealth. The secret police kept things in order. You've got the AVH in Hungary. You've got the Stasi in East Germany. Uh, however, 1953, there was a glimmer of hope. Stalin died, the brutal dictator died, and was replaced by Khrushchev. And Khrushchev uh, began, uh, to the surprise of many, to actually introduce uh, many, many reforms. Um, first of all, he announced, to everybody's surprise, a secret speech behind closed doors, which denounced Stalin. Stalin, uh, everything everybody had thought of him for the last uh, 30 years was absolutely debunked. Um, Khrushchev let rip on what this man was really like and he began a process in the back of that of de-Stalinization taking down statues, painting over the walls even getting his body from the mausoleum where he sat, where he had sat with Lenin and uh, putting it, burying it in the, the Kremlin grounds uh, Khrushchev apologised to Yugoslavia for its brutal treatment and he also very importantly announced you know what, East, West we may not share ideologies, but we can live in what he called peaceful coexistence. This was a glimmer of hope. This was a thawing in the Cold War, um, and it led to um, a, a sort of steady warmth in relations, and definitely the first meeting between East and West in a long time. However, as you should know, this wave of reform led to a wave of hope, and that hope was in Eastern Europe. And countries like Germany, like Poland, so protests for change and out of all those countries Hungary was the one that stood out most. Uh, a wave of student protests led to Rokosi, the brutal communist dictator being replaced by a reformer, a reforming communist called uh, Imri Naj. And Naj set about producing rapid reforms. He promised free elections. He promised that Hungary would perhaps leave the Warsaw Pact. Uh, this here was too much for Khrushchev. He wasn't prepared to let that happen. He sent in 6,000 tanks and 30,000 people were killed in that beautiful city of Budapest and around Hungary. And uh, one quarter of a million actually fled Hungary to the freedom, to the lights of the of the West. Um, but an absolute, uh, an absolute tragedy happened in Hungary, uh, which really did plummet east and west into the, the depths of despair again and made the end of the 1950s look as cold as uh, 1948. So you can see this is kind of like a roller coaster of relations uh, over this period which you do have to highlight. Now my conclusion is right at the bottom there, I could have took a new slide for this but you can see it's, it's actually very simple, it's three lines in this case and all I've did is uh, summarise the overview of my uh, whole answer there. That's all you need to do as well too. It just needs to be a short summary, summing up what you've put down. If it's a good answer, it'll stand out. Okay, so I hope this has helped. Um, I'm going to leave you then with this one here, okay? So we've given you one before. This is one for you to try out. So it's uh, how did the USSR respond to challenges to its power in the 1950s and 60s? Respond to challenges to its power the 1950s and 60s. You can see by this question, it's not asking you for everything I know about, it's asking you for how they responded to challenges. Uh, and you can see there's three different bullet points, Hungarian uprising, disagreements with Berlin, and Czechoslovakia in 1968, also known as the Prague Spring. So give that a go and see what you think. I hope this has been useful. I'll try to put some more um, online that I, that I possibly can. Uh, but this is a, just a little a sample of uh, how to get the top marks in this uh, question. Good luck. All the best.